what, what we need to uh, be clear in our minds about is that this is not, uh, uh, say, Dominic Cummings or whoever it was in there, some isolated person tapping out coded messages like a hostage uh, to the outside uh, world. Dominic Cummings is at the heart of the government's strategy. His tone, uh, if uh, those messages are from him, might be more brittle, uh, less diplomatic, maybe wholly undiplomatic uh, than, than other people would like in there. It, it might be making uh, civil servants blanche. I know it's making uh, some cabinet ministers uneasy, uh, but it is pretty close to the government line. They but think all hope is gone from the deal we be process. Told in this hour of absolute crisis, exactly who is saying all these things? Well, there are various ways these things work, uh, and right now this is a government that is operating in this particular style, with a very um, uh, strident individual at the heart of it, uh, who's almost bursting to move on to the next phase in all of this, you sense. And the next phase is the blame game. And we're already seeing a little bit of that with forces around Whitehall saying that Leo Varadkar, the Chishok, uh, when Boris Johnson met him in New York, was indicating if Britain moved on single market uh, goods re regulation in Northern Ireland, Ireland would move on the customs union. And this is where it all went wrong because Ireland didn't reciprocate. I have to say there are people uh, in Dublin who say they, uh, to put it politely, don't recognise uh, that version of events. But we'll get more and more on the blame game. But the other real next phase in all of this, assuming there is a delay, and it's interesting, those messages coming out from uh, number 10 uh, speak to both versions of the future, but one of them does indicate that actually there is a bit of a uh, assumption working in some minds in there that uh, there will be a delay. We then move on to the election, and the, the central point in the election strategy that emerges from the notes that have been sent out of uh, number 10 uh, to journalists is that if there is a, an election, on the grounds that we currently expect it, after a failure to get an agreement, Boris Johnson will run in that election to try to maximise the leave vote on a no-deal ticket. Tented villages around Westminster protesting a climate in crisis. Number 10 A, Dominic Cummings, arriving for work, looked like he might have slept in one of the tents. Overnight, a lengthy text from a number 10 aide, widely believed to be him, went to a journalist at The Spectator. The text warned EU countries that supporting a delay in the Brexit date will be seen by this government as hostile interference in domestic politics. Any idea the UK would play by the rules after a delay and obey the duty of sincere cooperation will be in the toilet. Over 800 words of texting warned EU members backing delay that they'd be seen as having been colluding with a parliament that is as popular as the clap. The text also suggested that defence and security cooperation with the EU would be affected if the UK was kept in and Brexit was delayed. Is he proud of the tone and character of quasi-official briefings and language coming out of number 10? Does he think it is helpful? Well, uh, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend. And, um, uh, he, he wasn't was going there. Because, the European also, Council president did. The... Donald Tusk tweeted directly at the Prime Minister, What's at stake is not winning some stupid blame game. At stake is the future of Europe and the UK, as well as the security and interests of our people. You don't want a deal. You don't want an extension. You don't want to revoke. Quo Vardis. Where are you going? Then, as if life around Westminster wasn't unrecognisable enough, Another briefing from a number 10 figure gave a combative summary of a phone chat between the Prime Minister and Chancellor Merkel. Angela Merkel made clear a deal is overwhelmingly unlikely, the number 10 source said. If Germany wanted to leave the EU, they could do it, no problem. But the UK cannot leave without leaving Northern Ireland behind in a customs union. The source went on, it is clear they are willing to torpedo the Good Friday Agreement. If it was a decisive phone call, the Cabinet weren't told about it at their meeting. Chancellor Merkel's CDU party Brexit spokesman said the number 10 version of the phone call was completely improbable. The incredibly uh, long-winded texts that came out from number 10, the remarks this morning with the particular acidity talking about Chancellor Merkel, they look like they've got the fingerprints of one particular iPhone trigger happy individual who you know rather well, don't they? Dominic Cummings. Well, they, they do look like that, and I won't deny it. There would be no point doing so, but I have no evidence other than that I recognise his style, but it could easily have been someone <laughs> but else. But the style is to kick over the table and uh, cause as much disruption as possible, not particularly care about the consequences. Some would say, 
Well, there are many reasons I didn't join the government and uh, a fear of collateral damage for which I would have to be held responsible is one of them. The Prime Minister's negotiator, David Frost, was in Brussels for more talks today. Boris Johnson meeting European Parliament President, maybe meeting the Irish Prime Minister in Dublin at the end of the week. But the number 10 texter is not the only one who thinks the talks are going nowhere. And an election now looms in which that texter says Boris Johnson will try to get a majority to back him on a no-deal Brexit. Gary Gibbon reporting there. Our Europe editor Matt Fry now joins me. Matt, you can actually feel the fury, the heat of anger coming out of Europe. You bet you can. I mean, in that Donald Tusk uh, tweet, of course, today, I've been speaking to my contacts in Brussels and Berlin all day long, and I have to say, certainly on the German side, quite a lot of anger management. I mean, they were not being openly uh, seething at what's been going on here, but they are very disappointed and, frankly, resigned to what they had been preparing for for some time now, which is that there will be a no-deal Brexit. Let me just tweet you what one very senior uh, German uh, official had to say. I, didn't, I don't see how we can change the preconceived anti-EU and anti-German ideas of parts of the British media and politics. The German position has not changed. We are committed to end uh, to, to carry on uh, talking. We're interested in finding a solution to prevent a no-deal scenario that would be bad for both sides. So I think officially, although they fear that the deal is dead, they are not going to be the ones issuing the death certificate, John. So they will carry on at least officially, rhetorically, trying to reach a deal. But I think quietly they're preparing for something else. Another thing came up. Um, this is someone in Brussels, again, at a very senior level um, in the whole Brexit business, who told me that this was Boris Johnson's um, Battle of Britain moment. So they're getting a lot of this language. They're very upset by the poster that was put out today by um, the, the Brexit campaign. And they have said, if this is as bad as it looks now, any negotiations after we leave without a deal will be appalling. And as one German, senior German official told me, that if the 39 billion are not going to be paid, the effing gloves come off. So that gives you some idea of where we're heading. Matt Fry. Well, now, uh, joining us from Westminster is the Shadow Brexit Secretary, Keir Starmer. Good uh, evening. Keir Starmer, thank you very much for joining us. Where do you think we are tonight? Well, let's call a spade a spade. The government has put forward proposals just six days ago which were never going to work. Uh, the moment you looked at them, and objectively speaking, they were never going to work. Um, and then when they were challenged or questioned, instead of adjusting their position, they're provoking the collapse of the talks. That's what they want. They're trying to collapse the talks, being as provocative as they can, and, and then starting uh, a ridiculous and reckless blame game. They blame Parliament, they blame the opposition, they blame the Ben Act, they blame Germany, Ireland. They won't take responsibility for their own actions. They put the proposals on the table, nobody else. They were never going to run. The government knew that. They were designed to fail. And now they're going down this reckless path of just collapsing the talks um, and putting the future of the country at stake. Uh, and until this moment, I mean, until the last few days, I mean, uh, nobody ever talked about splitting off Northern Ireland in the way that's been proposed. And uh, one presumes Labour was never thinking of anything like that. No, of course not. What we said is that uh, the whole of the UK should stay in a customs union, partly because that's the only way that you can actually safeguard manufacturing in this country. It's what every manufacturing business wants. But also because, quite honestly, it's impossible to keep the open border in Northern Ireland unless you're in a customs union. And this is at the heart of the proposals by the government. They say, uh, we want to come out of the customs union. They know very well that means you've got to then have customs checks. And they know very well that that means customs checks and infrastructure in Northern Ireland. And they won't admit it. And that puts the Good Friday Agreement in jeopardy. Uh, and the principle behind that agreement was one of consent of both communities in Northern Ireland. And that principle is being trashed. Do you think that, and you have many good contacts with uh, Europeans uh, who are looking at all this and working yeah. at it, do you think there's any possibility they may suddenly turn to us and say, right, you have a Norway deal, so you have a customs union and you have, you know, everything that goes with that. And that's it. Get on with it. I've never... Um, 
heard the EU saying that if you want a close economic relationship that keeps the basic economic model a close alignment, then that can't be negotiated. Um, and that's the model we've been operating for 50 years. That's the model our economy is based on. And I've never, frankly, understood the argument that as a result of the referendum, we must take an axe to the economy. I've never understood or accepted that argument. So I don't think that's the difficult bit. The problem here is the government knows full well uh, what the implications of its proposals were, and it should be using this week to adjust its proposals. But in the end, you, you, I heard the various texts and messages um, read out just a moment ago on your programme. They are provoking and designed to bring about the collapse of the talk because that's what people centrally in government want. They want a no-deal Brexit. Well, tonight, you in Labour face the possibility of a very soon general election uh, in which, literally, it will yeah. be a choice between no deal and Jeremy Corbyn and there's no great popularity about either of them well let's just um, go through that we've got a conservative party which is being driven to no deal and you can see the dismay of many conservative MPs about that that isn't the party that they think they're part of the the, the one nation Tory party it's a right-wing no deal party so they're being driven into that place because Johnson can't now go into an election saying I'm going to get a deal because he is he is pulling the plug on the only deal he's prepared to put forward. So he has to go into it saying no deal. You've then got um, the Liberal Democrats who say um, we want to revoke or rub out um, the uh, result. And you've got the Labour Party, as it were, sitting in the middle saying, actually, let's resolve this by a referendum. Give people the choice now. You know the terms on which you can leave. Do you want to leave on those terms? If so, we leave. If not, uh, we will remain, and that could happen within six months, and we would introduce legislation to that effect. And do you know That's what? A, that, 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 that is a very complicated thing to suddenly put on a ballot. Vote for just what you've said. Surely the fact of the matter is this is a massive crisis in which people have to have the choice yeah. between what you've set out that the Tories are going to go for and remaining for the moment, or at least remaining until uh, there's been a deal of some sort which you put Look, to the country. John, I know many people... Um, who want to fight for Remain, and I will campaign for Remain, but I think most of those people, in my experience, recognise that if that is to happen, they have to fight for it and win it in a referendum and settle this uh, on that basis. And what you can't do is drive to either no deal on the one hand or just cancel the outcome on the other. So this is the only way to involve the public properly in breaking the impasse and people across the country whether they voted leave or remain want to break the impasse more than anything else this is a way to do it and to settle it um, and it's to say look we we do know the terms on which we can leave which we didn't know before if you want to leave on those terms so be it if on the other hand you want to remain then we will remain it's a very very simple uh, proposition it's the only way now to break the impasse Keir Starmer thank you very much indeed for joining us well just before the government published its 159-page document on how Britain should get prepared for a no-deal Brexit, a gloomy new report by the Institute for Fiscal Studies was warning that leaving the EU without a deal would push Britain's debt to its highest level for half a century, advising ministers not to indulge in tax giveaways or a public spending spree. Our political correspondent Liz Bates has this report. Can a no-deal Brexit deliver the sunlit uplands promised by the government? Or are economic storm clouds gathering? The man officially overseeing the government's Brexit strategy, Michael Gove, just hours after talks between Britain and the EU appeared on the verge of collapse, was insisting that no deal could be a success. Of course no deal will bring challenges. I have been open about that today, as I have been in the past. It's not my preferred outcome, nor the government's. We want a good deal. But whatever challenges no deal may create in the short term, and they are significant, these can and will be overcome. But his detractors were lining up. Three and a half years on, the reason why we haven't left the EU is because the simple truth of it is, is that whichever way you do it, it is going to harm our economy and it's going to cut jobs and the future prosperity of our constituents. And a leading think tank agrees trade and growth will suffer in its latest damning assessment of Britain's economic prospects outside the EU. 
The Institute for Fiscal Studies forecast that under a smooth exit, government borrowing would stay at around £50 billion a year. Under a no-deal scenario, it says that would more than double, topping £100 billion as the economy slows. That will push the national debt to well over 80% of national income, the highest level since the mid-60s. But is this all too gloomy? Are you properly taking account of the positives that Brexit could have on the UK economy? We take into account things like the fact that if we were to leave under no deal, we would no longer be a net contributor to the EU budget. That's clearly a saving for the UK government. But fundamentally, if you make trade with your nearest and richest um, neighbour more expensive to do, more difficult to do, you'll do less of it. And if you do less trade, on average, your economy will be smaller than otherwise would be. Amid warnings about the future, a stark reminder of the immediate impact from Ireland's finance minister as he delivered his budget. I am today announcing a package of over 1.2 billion euro, excluding EU funding, to respond to Brexit. With the cost of Brexit already mounting, the real price of no deal is yet to be revealed. Our political correspondent Liz Bates reporting there. Now, the leader of the Democratic Unionists has declared that any demand to keep Northern Ireland inside the customs union after Brexit would be beyond crazy. Sinn Féin's deputy leader, Michelle O'Neill, though, took the opposite view, insisting that Northern Ireland can't withstand being excluded from the customs union and the single market, accusing the government of playing fast and loose with our livelihoods. Whatever the outcome, there is so much at stake on the island of Ireland. Our correspondent Kieran Jenkins is in County Antrim. Well, Northern Ireland, of course, is the Brexit front line, and this is where for, for farmers and all manner of industries, in fact, no deal has real life ramifications overnight, and where all the latest political manoeuvrings make about as much sense as some of the sounds coming from these animals here. Tonight, there is grave concern as the blame is being sprayed around in Westminster and here in Ireland. Boris Johnson and the Irish Taoiseach spoke for 40 minutes on the phone today. They're expected to, to meet uh, later this week under the backdrop uh, of anonymous briefings coming from Number 10 and the DUP uh, accusing Dublin of setting traps. And that drew this response from the Irish government today. No deal, they say, would be on the UK and no one else. They are resigned in Northern Ireland to there being hardly a whiff of a deal anymore. And so the warnings of no deal, from farming to food and the threat to peace here, grow more urgent. Who will people hold responsible if this comes to pass? Eventually it has to be the politicians on all sides, the Europeans, the British, everybody. You won't just be pointing fingers at Angela Merkel, will you, and saying it's her fault? No, don't know her personally. <laughs> They're staring here at suffocating bureaucracy and scorching no-deal tariffs on beef, sheep, milk, all manner of trade going south. While the same items may come from the south tariff-free. I do not know if Northern Ireland agriculture can stand the hiccup of a no-deal. The tariff schedule as it's set out at the minute would crucify us. We're uh, facing tariffs on the way out, and yet we all the UK's allowing stuff in more or less tariff free, and that would just be curtains for agriculture as we know it. To anyone who thinks that no deal is a plausible outcome for Northern Irish farmers, what do you say? Well, milk is facing a 25% cut on tariffs. Unless these tariffs change and that milk is needed somehow very quickly across the water, we're facing no market for 700 million litres of milk. So the Ulster Farmers Union still want the backstop. But following that anonymous briefing from Number 10 about German Chancellor Angela Merkel, the DUP say the backstop's been exposed as a trap to keep Northern Ireland in the EU Customs Union forever. Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister appeared exasperated at the briefing from Downing Street. Responsibility for no deal, he says, will never be on Ireland or the EU. There is a lot of misinformation going around today. A no deal Brexit will never be Ireland's choice. It will never be the EU's choice. If it happens, 
it'll be a decision made by the British government. Despite all the grave warnings, few seem surprised we've ended up here with just three weeks left. On this island, the blame game kicked off long ago. Well, let's get some more reaction to today's events. From Westminster, I'm joined by the Liberal Democrat Leila Moran and the Conservative Gillian Keegan, who's a PPS to the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. Gillian Keegan, um, well, the Cummings wing have made it clear that if there is an election um, after a delay, then it will be force on no deal, getting Brexit done immediately. Are you somebody who uh, was very much uh, against no deal prepared to go along with that? Well, I think what they've actually said is it's the government's strong preference to get a deal. And they have put forward a deal. They uh, want to sit down and negotiate a deal. And, and they will work to every hour till the last hour to get a deal. Yeah, but you've read the briefings. You know what they say. They make it clear that if the deal falls uh, and the uh, extension kicks in, they will fight the election on Brexiting straight away. Will well, you, the first thing is you, you need an you election. Will you go along with that? The first thing is you need an election. So first thing, the, the, the deal needs to fall. I am, I am, I mean, despite the rhetoric, and this is always to be expected, I've been telling constituents of mine uh, for, for a long time, this level of rhetoric as we get towards the end of this process is going to be deafening. All the signalling, all the positioning, all of the blaming, it's perfectly reasonable to see where a deal can land here to avoid all the things that you you've just been talking about. You are avoiding my question, aren't you? I no, mean, I'm not. I'm basically saying... <laughs> I'm asking you a simple the... question, which is if it comes to it, are you prepared to campaign for no deal? I've always said I absolutely am against no deal, mostly because, first of all, the reason we'd be in that situation is because 30 MPs of any colour have not voted for a deal, a previous deal, in the House of Commons, or because the EU will not sit down and negotiate, again, another perfectly reasonable offer from the UK government to a good starting point, they very much tried to take into account the concerns uh, that have been expressed. And if they refuse to sit down, then it makes no sense to do no deal. Do you but think... actually, if they push us to a situation, let's be honest here, the EU have tried to have this in a way, their own way. Article 50 stacks it all in their all right. favour in well, terms we'll of sequencing. And now they're trying to say we're not going to sit down and have a conversation. Do, do you they think... need to sit down and have a conversation. That's the responsible thing to do. Do you think Dominic Cummings' wings need clipping? I don't think Dominic Cummings is, is, is... I don't even know Dominic Cummings. I listen to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Ministers. And, yes, he, if he's okay. saying things like... Uh, what, the, what the next strategy is going to be and what's going to be in the manifesto, that is way outside of his job description, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Leila Moran, um, do you now uh, seem to agree with many Conservatives that no deal is preferable to Jeremy Corbyn? Absolutely not, no, and we've never said that. I, I absolutely would not accept that, and neither has Joe Swinson and no one else in the party. No deal. And why won't you back and This is where Gillian and I are on the same side. No deal would be utterly catastrophic for this country, and no one wants that. And what we've ever done is point out that actually he needs the numbers. Even if we did back him, he still also needs to get... You heard Amber Rudd on the Today programme this morning say that there is no way she would back him. We've heard countless Conservative, now independent or former Conservative MP, say the same thing. If Jeremy Corbyn even tried to do this, he would fail. It would be an utterly embarrassing for him. So let's but move on that conversation and find someone. But you're not prepared to say you would back someone. him either way. But and that doesn't bode well, does no it, for point. doing any deals come the election? You know, I the idea that is... Remainers will be able to agree in seats over where to, where to vote tactically in order to stop a no-deal Brexit is fast disappearing, isn't it? Because you no, and Labour are, are, are in disagreement. Not at all. And actually, we are high-level talks about how we form a Remain alliance across this country for the next election are still ongoing. But the fact is, Jeremy Corbyn has never had the numbers. And the sooner he accepts that, it's not about the Liberal Democrats. It's actually, actually, the real, the real boogeyman in this room is Boris Johnson. And at the last point in your, in your video just now, it was clear. He is the one who can choose to take this country off no deal or not. What we need to agree on is that we find a way to ensure that extension is secure. And whilst Boris Johnson has said that he will do it until he has sent the letter and it is signed, sealed and delivered, actually everything else is still on the table. No deal is the ultimate thing that we must avoid. Leila Moran, thank you very much indeed. Gillian Keegan, thank you as well.
Thank well, you. a short time ago, I spoke to the German MEP and Vice President of the European Parliament, Katarina Barley, and I began by asking if she thinks it's now impossible to get a deal. It's not over till it's over. I mean, um, we all believe that a hard Brexit is the worst of all solutions. And um, I think most people in the UK do too. If by the 31st October of October we don't have a solution, it's going to be a hard Brexit. So be it. But until then, we're all going to work for a better solution. You said if there isn't a deal by the end of October, then it's no deal. In fact, if there isn't a deal by the end of October, British law says that we must ask for an extension. Do you think there's any doubt that that extension would be granted? The European Parliament definitely would. I think there is a vast majority here for an extension. We do need some path uh, where this should go further because we have to explain it to our citizens too why we grant extension after extension. And, and do any of you think that Boris Johnson is sincere in seeking a deal or do you think he's, he's pretending? Well, that's a good question. Um... To be very honest, um, this whole Brexit matter from the very beginning on has served internal political issues, beginning from David Cameron and now ending with Boris Johnson, hopefully ending with Boris Johnson. Um, so in my, in my perception, it's always more about themselves, these leaders themselves, about their political future, about their political party then about the matter, the relationship between the UK and the European Union, and that is what is really the problem, I think. Leave.eu, which is the more hardline Brexit group, have been putting out these images, um, including one of Angela Merkel in a sort of a, um, a, a Hitler salute kind of pose, talking about Germans or, or, or saying Britain isn't going to be told after winning two world wars what to do by a kraut. I mean, with apologies for repeating the language, how do you feel about it? Well, I am as well as German as a British citizen, and this is really the most disturbing in the whole um, in the whole Brexit Brexit matter. That we see the whole achievement of the European Union. That we work together, we discuss with each other, we we fight, we we argue, but in the end, we come together as partners, as friends, as allies, and find common solutions. That this is being destroyed.